Hi everyone, I hope you're all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Rob Kennicutt, who is a professor at the University of Arizona and the Texas A&M University. My name is Evelyn Johnston, and together with Thomas Puzia, we have organized today's web webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, we have arranged for simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos, pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de Zoom. Before we continue, we'd like to acknowledge the generous support of, of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. If you're watching a recording of this talk on YouTube, please leave your questions and comments below. And please also share these talks with your friends and colleagues, like and subscribe. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series, give us feedback and uh, please send us also an email if you like. If you have any questions during the live talk, please type them in the Q&A window. You can also upvote questions and comment on them. We will select the best ones for the discussion after the talk. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our panel members that are with us today. Rob, of course, Evelyn and Patricio. Felipe Barrientos, who is the director of the Institute of Astrophysics, will be joining us a little later. Paul Eigenthaler, postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Astrophysics. And we have also our graduate students, Francisca Espinosa, Sergio Best, and Alvaro Valenzuela. We also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today. Mia de los Reyes, graduate student at the Department of Astronomy at the California Institute of, Te of Technology. Rohan Ratgaonka, recent graduate student from the University of Toledo and intern at Gemini Observatory. Elena Terlevich, faculty at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics and Electronics in Puebla in Mexico, currently on uh, lockdown at the Institute of Astronomy of the University of Cambridge. Monica Rubio, professor at the Department of Astronomy of the Universidad de Chile. Mario Abadi, astronomer at the Astronomical Observatory of the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. And Hans Zinnecker, astronomer emeritus and ex-deputy director of the Sofia Science Center at NASA Ames. Finally, we have also our excellent team of Q&A managers, Ricardo Acevedo, Daniela Fernandez and Carol Rojas. It is our pleasure to introduce Rob Kennicott as our speaker today. Rob was awarded his PhD in 1978 at the University of Washington. He was then a Carnegie Fellow working at both Caltech and the Hale Observatory, which is now known as the Carnegie Observatories. And in 1980, he was appointed as an assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Minnesota and in 1988, he moved to the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. In 2005, he moved again to Cambridge in the UK, where he was appointed as the Plumian Professor of Astronomy and Experimental Philosophy. And later on, he served as the Director of the Institute of Astronomy and as the head of the School of Physical Sciences. He retired from the University of Cambridge in 2017, becoming an Emeritus Professor there and he currently holds visiting appointments at the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona and the Mitchell Institute at the Texas A&M University. His main research area is the study of the evolutionary processes in nearby galaxies, such as star formation and chemical evolution and the calibration of the extragalactic distance scale. He's perhaps best known for his work on the eponymous Kennecott-Schmidt law which relates gas density to star formation. He also is known for his role in constraining the value of the Hubble constant, the unit of measurement that astronomers use to describe the expansion rate of the universe. He has received many awards and distinctions for his research, including the Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2009. He currently serves as the co-chair for the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey that prioritizes the most important scientific and technological activities in astronomy and astrophysics for the next decade. Today, Rob has joined us to tell us about the cosmic ecosystem, asking the question, isn't star formation a bit like the weather? 
Rob, please, the audience is yours. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. I assume you can see everything, Thomas? Yeah. It looks great. Great. Well, uh, thank you, not just for that very generous introduction, but for the honor of giving one of these webinars. Um, of course, I've been a frequent visitor to Chile since the 1970s, but of course, can't do that now. So uh, really uh, happy to see that I can uh, speak to everyone uh, the best way possible, at least under the circumstances. Uh, I was encouraged to give this very long, uh, a long title. Uh, I work on star formation and galaxy evolution mainly, as Thomas said. Um, when I began my career uh, back uh, in the 70s, 40 years ago, I guess now, uh, those were considered very distinct problems. I've always worked at the interface of the two, and by the end of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you that, in fact, these uh, two are just two aspects of one big problem. Uh, and to fully understand one, you're going to have to solve uh, the other problem as well. You're going to have to wait a while to understand the story behind that quotation. Isn't star formation a bit like the weather? Uh, if you stay awake through most of the talk, I will get to that about 10 minutes before the end. So let's uh, move on. And it, always with Zoom, yeah, it takes a minute to get started. Um, so as I work on star formation on the largest scales, basically uh, averaged over entire galaxies, looking across cosmic time and so on. Um, this is an important aspect of understanding the problem of star formation itself. And uh, the main benefit of looking at other galaxies is to study the same processes we can observe up close in the Milky Way over a much wider range of physical conditions than uh, are available to us in the Milky Way. Um, and the information you gain when you look on those large scales is also vital for understanding uh, how galaxies form and evolve. And the main reason for that is that uh, the principal mechanism for galaxy evolution is actually uh, convert, converting a raw material of interstellar gas into stars. And if you can understand how the gas and the stars, the properties of the gas connect to the numbers and properties of the, of the young stars, um, you actually uh, provide a very powerful tool for simulating and modeling galaxy evolution. Uh, as all, you'll become very clear to you, I think in a few minutes, the problem of star formation on any scale, but particularly on the largest scale, is a very complex and absolutely unsolved problem. Our understanding uh, of the process is in an embryonic state. And until we have a complete theory, a challenge that awaits uh, the next generation and beyond, we need shortcuts, we need observational hints, clues, uh, scaling laws and recipes, and the Schmidt law, or what Thomas referred to as the Kennecott Schmidt law, you'll hear me refer to as the Schmidt law through the talk, is an example of one such uh, recipe that's proven to be very valuable for understanding not just how stars form, but how galaxies form as well. Uh, the long range uh, goal of the work is to put that theory, try to come up with a theoretical explanation, a complete theoretical picture. Um, as I say, uh, this is not something you can write out in a series of equations in the on blackboard that you can solve. We have come a long way, though, in being able to simulate processes on the computer. And at the very end of the talk, I'll take a forward look to where that kind of work stands and what the outlook of the field is for the future. So th those are the goals. Uh, th those are the challenges uh, before us. Um, what makes them difficult uh, are really two things. One is when you look at the whole population of galaxies in our universe today or in the past, the range of star formation properties is immense. And the, the number of physical processes on the theoretical side you need to understand to solve the problem uh, is equally immense. 
And so I'm going to show you some examples of those in the next introductory slides. Before I do that, if you uh, call attention, your uh, look at the bottom of the slide, a couple of bookkeeping items. I will probably utter the words star formation and star formation rate 100 or 200 times. They will appear on ne nearly every slide. And to save space, I'll use these two abbreviations quite frequently, SF just for star formation and SFR for star formation rate. That's actually the term that's used in the literature nowadays, SFR. The other thing is I'm aware I have a very uh, diverse audience today. I was asked to give a talk at the level uh, of a colloquium, a seminar in an astronomy department. And usually that means a talk that uh, graduate PhD students can understand. But I know there are students and perhaps uh, other interested members of the audience who aren't quite up to that level of training. So I'll give a, I'm gonna spend the first 15 minutes or so introducing the subject, giving a little history. Uh, along the way though, I don't wanna bore the experts to death. And so what I've adopted is a little bit of color coding in my slides. Whenever you see a heading in black, like the, the, the text in this slide, this is a material I hope you're all reading and absorbing. But from time to time, I will give a few bits of more advanced information uh, that the experts will understand, but others may struggle with it. And those I'm going to code in blue. And so basically, if you're just managing to keep up with the talk, uh, you need a break, you can uh, relax a little when some blue comes up. I'll address it, but mainly for the uh, expert audience. So, um, Let's come back to those two challenges of the diversity of star formation. Even when you uh, look uh, at galaxies today, this is a depiction of Hubble's sequence of galaxies in the present day universe, the major types, elliptical, spiral, and so on. You can just tell from the images, uh, all that naughtiness you see in the right hand part of the slide is star formation. The whole sequence basically is a sequence in present day star formation activity and the dispersion and properties uh, from one end of that sequence to the other are enormous factors of a million at least and I'll quantify that uh, in a minute. Uh, moreover, if you extend uh, our observations of galaxies to the distant past as shown in this diagram, the famous Madao lily plot, what it's showing is as you look back in time, look at the top axis, present day, our present day here is on the left. Uh, there is my cursor. I hope some of you can see it. On the left is present day going back to the Big Bang toward the right. What is uh, plotted in the graph is the rate at which gas has been turned into stars over averaged over very large volumes of the universe over cosmic time. So you can see from the beginning, which is in the right edge of the slide, a star formation increased for a period of about 3 billion years, reaching a peak, what we call cosmic noon, about 10 billion years ago, and has declined about a factor of 10 ever since. So as wide a variety of star formation properties in galaxies as we see today, that variety only becomes larger when you look back in time uh, in the universe as well. Um, uh, and that is a slide that should have gone away. Um, so here uh, is a way to quant put, those, uh, put, put those slides into numbers. Um, this is a, a graph showing star formation activity in a sample of several hundred nearby galaxies, each point is a different galaxy. Our Milky Way is, a, if you can see that symbol here, right where my cursor is on the lower right. Uh, let me explain the axes. Going left to right is the rate at which uh, each galaxy forms stars uh, measured in the, uh, the mass of our sun. Think of this as suns being formed per year. Um, and it's on a logarithmic scale. It, it, it goes from one one hundred thousandth of a sun per year, solar mass per year, 
up, I don't, to I think a thousand uh, solar masses to, per year. I'm gonna move my little, yeah, see more of the slide. Um, and you see there's an enormous range, a factor of over a hundred million in those rates. That's what I mean by diversity. Uh, 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 more or less with a Milky Way somewhere in the middle of that distribution. Now, that's a little deceptive because one reason you're seeing such a large diversity is galaxies come in different masses and different sizes. Tiny dwarf galaxies have less of everything than giant galaxies. And that is contributing to this range you see. So in order to look at the star formation properties in another way, the y-axis is showing the same star formation rate for each galaxy, but normalized, where it, we divide that rate by the area, the surface area of that galaxy, the, disk, the region over which the stars are forming in that galaxy. You could normalize it to the mass of the galaxy as well. I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. You'd get the same kind of result. There's a reason I do this, and I'll, you'll see in a couple minutes why. But notice, so this takes out the big galaxies have more of everything uh, effect. And what you're looking here is essentially you're comparing each galaxy over the same fixed region of space um, in comparing relative star forming activity. And lo and behold, you still have a factor of 100 million in dispersion as well. So this variation in galaxy size is contributing part of the scatter in this diagram. But in fact, even when you look at, compare apples to apples, you see this extreme uh, variation. And, and any theory uh, of star formation has to try to explain that. Extremely challenging problem. Also notice there's almost, there is some correlation here from bottom to top. That's the mainly the uh, little galaxy versus big uh, galaxy phenomenon, not all of it. Um, but there are, even at any one star formation rate, there's over a factor of 10,000 variation in the other variable. So, uh, uh, so just a, a, a tough problem, right, to crack. Now, so that's the observational challenge. What about theoretically? Well, it gets no easier when you think about the theory. Um, this should be apparent to you is a self-generated slide uh, from me because it's so ugly. Uh, but, you know, it'll get the point across. Um, what it depicts in graphical form are all of the steps. Ima imagine you want to form a solar system like ours. You know, where did our solar system come from? Uh, all, if you're a, you, if you're a, 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 a pile of gas out in space, outside of a galaxy, and you eventually want to turn that gas into a star like the sun. What has to happen? What are all the steps that need to take place? And I'll take you, and the way you go through this diagram is follow the green uh, line around. So the first thing you do has to happen is the gas, which initially is just out diffuse gas in intergalactic space after the Big Bang, has to find its way to accrete onto a galaxy either onto a galaxy that already exists or a creep to form a new galaxy. So that's step one. Uh, once that happens, uh, you're only beginning because the gas that accretes is a plasma. It's very, uh, it's very hot, uh, first millions and then tens of thousands of degrees. Um, and it's in an ionized state, bare uh, nuclei and electrons. And the next thing that has to happen is once that gas settles into a galaxy, it takes a long time, it has to cool off. And as it cools, it will spin up and cool to form a disk usually uh, of a galaxy. Um, and by cool, I mean from millions or tens of thousands of degrees down to anywhere from about a hundred to a few thousand degrees. Um, next, the next step, uh, is actually three steps. And uh, this is a topic uh, my colleagues uh, like to debate all of the time. Three things before you can start forming a star forming cloud, you need to turn this diffuse gas into a cloud. 
that can form stars. And three things need to happen by the time you're finished. You, the, uh, the plasma needs to cool to form atoms, uh, mostly hydrogen and helium atoms. Uh, eventually, those atoms need to further condense and cool to form molecules, we call molecular clouds. And somewhere along the way, those clouds need to become uh, gravitationally bound, self-gravitating, so they can continue condensing until they eventually form uh, protostellar cores and stars. Uh, what the order of those processes is, is debated endlessly, even to this date. And my view is, it depends, the order of processes <coughs> depends on what kind of galaxy you are in, where in that galaxy you are, what time and cosmic history, and so on. At any rate, you go, this series of processes happens, usually one of them triggers the other two, and you eventually form, at the end of the process, molecular clouds, which are uh, vital, the first vital ingredients to form stars. Then, uh, that's even not enough. When the molecular cloud forms, uh, condensations need to form inside of it, what we call molecular clumps, or eventually molecular cores. Most, as I'll show you later, most of a molecular cloud never forms stars, at least in terms of volume, and uh, condensations need to form uh, within the clouds. Once that happens, the rest of the process seems to be fairly deterministic in the sense that those cores then need to cool even further. We're now talking about temperatures of uh, several to degrees to tens of degrees above absolute zero, and they uh, condense and then begin heating up. And at the end of a complicated process that many members of our panel work on, uh, uh, stars and planetary systems form out of those. So how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps uh, at least uh, to uh, before you get a solar system like ours. And I've left out a lot of the detail. Um, everything I've described up to here gives the impression this is a unidirectional, uh, simple A, B, C, D, E, F process, obviously with some complication at C, D, E. But in fact, uh, what we've learned uh, over the last uh, decade or two uh, is that the process actually doesn't even stop there. Once the stars form, um, they have an effect on their surroundings, especially if you form very massive stars, stars much more massive than our sun. Uh, as those stars go through their lives, they inject energy into their surroundings from winds. The most massive of those stars explode in supernovae. Um, uh, the, even the low mass stars uh, have outflows which inject energy into the clouds. And the net result is in a large star cluster, it's very possible those stars will throw more energy back into their parent cloud than they took out and they can actually blow the cloud to smithereens eventually. This is called feedback. In extreme cases that we'll be talking about, uh, you can even blow the entire gas and entire galaxy to smithereens in what we call a super wind. So all of these, uh, so this energy gets uh, and momentum and particles and heavy elements all get spewed back and where do they get spewed back? They get spewed back in every part of this process. Some goes back into the molecular cloud and can disrupt the cloud or cause it to refragment. Some goes into the general interstellar medium, heats it. Some of it can leave the galaxy entirely and actually reinitiate this whole process from the beginning. So what we have is more of what we nowadays know is rather than a single process is a cycle, often called the baryon cycle, and I have a lot more to say about it. That's the ecosystem I'm talking about, and we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Okay, so got to get done. I'm almost half hour in, and I'm going to get through my introduction, so move quicker here. So um, with all that complexity, 
uh, you'd be with, if you're a student out there, you're an undergrad student trying to decide whether you want to do a PhD on this subject for your thesis, uh, you'd be within your rights to run away as fast as you can, right? It's just very, very complicated. Uh, so it's no, it's still a marvel to me, no small miracle that if you take this graph I've been showing you, and we're going to take the very same a subset of the very same galaxies, and we're going to replace this x axis, we're going to leave the y axis exactly as it is, we're going to replace the x axis with the surface density of gas, the concentration of, this is the concentration of star formation vertically, the star formation, the concentration of star formation instead of gas, excuse me, on the x-axis, this dispersion of a factor of 100 million reduces to a dispersion of a factor of three or four. And you get one by standards of 100 million, very tight correlation, one, notice it links all the, the normal galaxies like the Milky Way down here to these so-called starburst galaxies we'll talk about in a minute into a single relation, a nonlinear relation. If it was slope of one, it would be trivial. It's, uh, you get, it's very nonlinear. And this is what's known as the Schmidt law, what, what we've talked about. That's the scaling law we're gonna talk about for the uh, rest of this talk. Um, that scaling law is only one of many. Um, could give a whole talk on scaling laws in astrophysics and just for galaxies. Here's another example. This is star formation rate of galaxies plotted as a function of their stellar masses, <coughs> total number of stars, think of it. And you see they define a tight nonlinear sequence as well, in this case with two branches rather than one. Not surprisingly, this is partly can be derived from this one. Um, what's interesting about this one is uh, this is the relation as it is today in the universe. If you look at earlier cosmic times, uh, this relation rises. In other words, this, as, as you approach cosmic noon, the rate of star formation in the sequence goes up by nearly a, over a factor of 10. Um, but it keeps its shape. It preserves its form through all of cosmic time. So these scaling laws, uh, the, the key, this should give you a feeling that these scaling laws give us hope. Even though nature has thrown us a, a tremendous complexity, both physically and observationally, when you find clues like this, you realize maybe there are some simple answers that can allow us at least to model these processes, if not understand them uh, physically. So, um, so that's sort of the broad introduction uh, to the Schmidt law. Let me, uh, I'm gonna go through this a little quick and skip one or two slides maybe, but let me again for the broader audience give you a little introduction to uh, this concept. Uh, that relation uh, that I've just shown you was first discovered in 1998. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, but it was actually predicted 40 years earlier by Martin Schmidt. Uh, most of you may know Schmidt as the discoverer of quasars. Um, this might even be, I think this is his Time Magazine cover photo. Uh, no, he's older than that, sorry. This is a more recent photo of Martin who postulated that perhaps uh, the main determinant of a star formation rate per unit volume or per unit area is the concentration of gas. Fundamentally, it probably works in three dimensions. We can't observe most galaxies in three dimensions. So the one we work with is uh, the one that we can measure when we see the universe in projection. It by itself cannot be a complete description of star formation, obviously, for, given all that complexity, but it can give you some good clues. And uh, for the aficionados, just three examples of how different physical mechanisms which would drive star formation would give you different indices in this law. So for example, if it's the rate of cloud collisions which dominates the star formation rate, this coefficient would be two quadratic dependence. If star formation is driven by some un, uh, universal efficiency, the idea that some fraction, maybe five or 10% of all molecular clouds turn into stars no matter where you are, that would imply a linear 
relationship just depends on the mass of molecular gas. And if you have gravitational instabilities, instead, things like genes instability, pre-fall times, dominating star formation, you, that's the intermediate case, n equals uh, 1.5. For the first 30 years after Schmidt introduced the law, um, there were over 70 studies trying to calibrate it. Uh, here's a summary of just the slopes that were derived. They cover the full range of possibilities, including even negative values. That would mean more gas, less stars, not very physical. Uh, whenever you see this much dispersion, the conclusion you draw is we know nothing. Uh, 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 the, the, either the data, there was something wrong with the data or the experiments, and indeed that was the problem. These were based on incomplete measurements of either the star formation, the gas, or both. Um, the, the beginnings of our modern picture came in the 1980s and 90s when mainly the development of uh, molecular line astronomy that allowed us to measure molecules and galaxies and aperture synthesis arrays, uh, both in the centimeter, for example, the very large array uh, in New Mexico and the ALMA array, of course, uh, the latest example, uh, more recently up in, uh, in the Atacama, uh, at the same, uh, that allow us to map the gas and molecular gas so we could get the entire gas budget, cold gas budget of a galaxy. And then uh, the work that I mainly did over this period was calibrating a toolbox for measuring the rates for galaxies of how rates in which they measure stars using various wavelength observables. Another key breakthrough that I'll talk about in the middle in a minute was uh, the development of space in, uh, infrared satellites, which discovered a new class, a regime of star formation in the universe, so-called infrared luminous starburst galaxies. These are galaxies similar in mass to our Milky Way, but which are forming stars up to a hundred times, well, in the case of the Milky Way, a thousand times faster than the Milky Way. They are uh, dynamic systems. They are not stable galaxies. They're generally the products of mergers, collisions of galaxies that have triggered massive bursts of star formation. And the gas is so dense that these regions of star formation are all but invisible, invisible light and the ultraviolet. You can only detect that star formation by going into the uh, infrared part of the spectrum. In any case, that enabled us to uh, 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 suddenly uh, begin to see evidence for uh, uh, the modern sort of form of the Schmidt Law. Uh, the first was a series of studies in the 1980s and 90s um, where uh, very limited samples of galaxies were mapped in both molecular gas, that's uh, here, CO is a proxy for molecular hydrogen on the right, atomic hydrogen here, and then two measures of star formation. Uh, and you were able to plot, go, in this case, going from the outside of a galaxy toward the center, how the star formation rate changed as uh, the gas density increased. And what we found uh, were two of the three main regimes of star formation I'll be talking about. In the main disks of these galaxies, say in here, in NGC 6946, and here in M83, uh, where there is uh, abundant gas clouds, the star formation, in fact, is quite tightly correlated with this N equals about 1.4 or 1.5 power law, the Schmidt law. So the first hints of this were seen in 1989. But there's a region exemplified by the outer parts of this galaxy where you see gobs of atomic hydrogen, where the star formation turns over abruptly. There's still a little bit out here. It doesn't go away entirely. But uh, basically, this inner disk, which contains about half of the total hydrogen gas in the disk, has more like 99.5% of the star formation, whereas the other half of the disk has almost you know, a, a percent or less. And that's this regime out here that we call the threshold regime. Um, 
As soon as papers like this were published, theoreticians and observers alike uh, began to uh, uh, try to interpret them. Uh, but uh, before we go there, I want to bring us up to speed. Uh, this is then in 1998 uh, is the dawn of uh, the relation that Tom uh, referred to. This is work I did. Uh, uh, what instead of taking uh, looking at within individual galaxies, I took uh, a set of about 130 sorry about 100 galaxies, normal galaxies down here, these infrared luminous starburst galaxies up here, and just measured one number for each. Just put an aperture around the extent of the star formation rate, got the average rate of star formation rate per unit area, the average density of gas, both atomic and molecular. And this was the first discovery of that Schmidt law I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, this has been a very influential paper. The, uh, the main uh, application of it is it's used as a recipe when you want to uh, do analytical models or simulations of galaxies, you plug in the equation of this line in lieu of a full physical model. And in fact, when you use that to predict, if you know the distribution of gas, you can predict the amount of star formation. And the galaxies that come out of these simulations look remarkably like the real ones. So it's just, this gives us a shortcut, uh, a recipe it's often called for that. Um, and that's the main value, and that continues to be the value of this law today. Um, but there's a follow-up question, and that's what I'm gonna devote most of the rest of the talk to, is question naturally arises. Look, if nature is this simple, if star formation in all of these galaxies with this you know, 10 to the eight variation in properties can be approximated with a simple polynomial expression, and the noise, by the way, is dominated by observational noise, could the physics be that simple? Is there a simple one-stop equation or explanation uh, physically can explain that as well? And fast forward, uh, not to disappoint, but no. <laughs> the physics uh, turns out not to be explainable in any simple way, but that didn't stop any of us from trying for the next 20 years. Uh, so over the next, ever since actually, so that's what, 22 years, uh, a lot of idiots in the field have been trying to reduce, to come up with one-stop shopping, a simple explanation for all of these observations. And idiot number one in line was yours truly. Uh, even in this, these same papers, I speculated. And so when I use the word idiot, I'm mainly referring to myself, not to my esteemed colleagues. Uh, for example, it is very tempting to uh, associate uh, this, not only this 1.4 or 1.5 slope, but also these thresholds with gravitational instabilities. And look at all the blue here. So for the experts, uh, disks uh, are known to be unstable uh, at very low density. They are stable against uh, forming condensations. Uh, at high densities, they will be unstable. It's so-called, in surface density, tumoric criterion. Depends on the kinematics of the gas and its orbital properties. In any case, uh, when, you, uh, when you apply this to the measurements of these galaxies, you reproduce not only the, uh, the thresholds, you predict the thresholds, you actually predict where they appear, the radii in which they appear with remarkable accuracy. And you even reproduce the distribution of gas and radius in the galaxies. So this caused me and a bunch of other people to go over the edge and say, this must be the answer. Uh, you can also uh, apply, you can apply a free fall time uh, from gravity to predict the time scale for star formation and you roughly reproduce the slope of this relation as well. Um, just to show you, I'm not the only person capable of being an idiot. Uh, this Tumere model 
Uh, it was published in 1989 when many people in the audience, including uh, my co-author, uh, Mia de los Reyes was yet to be born. Uh, uh, others of Mia's generation uh, over the last few years have rediscovered this and published it as a new discovery uh, explanation because you know they're too young to remember the old papers. Uh, one of them, uh, you should recognize that name Genzel uh, Reinhardt. It was one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize a week ago Tuesday. So it just goes to show I don't feel so idiotic when I see a Nobel you know, Prize winner. Can, uh, he didn't win the Nobel Prize for this, by the way. <laughs> Nothing close, but uh, can uh, fall down the same trap. Uh, but that's only one. So what happened next in the subject? Then, uh, uh, so the next step was to use these beautiful observations instead of looking at entire, averaging over entire galaxies, let's look uh, one, uh, one re divide galaxies into lots of individual pixels and look at the relations between star formation rate and gas uh, within individual galaxies. Uh, and that work, you're gonna see pictures of the people listed down here who are responsible for that work. I'm not involved in most of this work. Uh, and uh, when you look on that basis, you see very similar relations to what you saw before. A Schmidt law regime at high density and then a uh, threshold regime, but the interpretation entirely different. When, uh, when you uh, divide the gas by phase, you look separately at the atomic gas and the molecular gas on the right, atomic gas on the left, you say that the distinction between the threshold regime and the, uh, and the Schmidt law regime seems have to do very little with gravity. It simply could be whether the gas is primarily atomic or molecular, right? The other difference is this slope is completely different. This is not a slope of 1.5 or 1.4, it's about one. It's a linear relation. And so, in fact, what these studies and a lot of studies since have revealed is an entirely different explanation for the same set of observations. That instead of the distinction between uh, the Schmidt regime and the threshold regime being something like tumor instability or genes instability, it could just be a phase change transition in the interstellar medium between making molecular gas out of atomic uh, gas. And this 1.4 slope that you get in that picture has nothing to do with self-gravity. It has to do that when you average a linear relation by molecules, which are really driving this perturbation with this nearly vertical, but not completely vertical atomic relation, you average those two together, you get uh, 1.4. So I, uh, I've already said this, I'm not going to read this out to you, but uh, we're faced, if you want to reduce this problem to one simple explanation, we have two completely different scenarios. Top down, where gravity operating on large scales drives that whole cascade of processes until down to the form molecular clouds, or it could be the other way around, that what's determining the star formation rate is actually not set until you form those molecular clouds and cloud cores that a certain fraction of order 10% of the molecules turn into stars and everything on larger scales is just a cascade backwards of that physics. And given the observation I've showed you, people argue one is better than the other, but you really can't tell. Uh, before moving on to the present and future, uh, it's even more complicated than that. Uh, since the, those studies were published, uh, the uh, measurements of molecular depletion times or efficiencies have been extended to a much wider range of starburst and normal galaxies. The, the galaxies we showed you from the Beguil and Leroy studies here all have pretty much the same depletion time here, uh, but in fact, across the whole Hubble sequence 
and including starburst galaxies, there's actually a range of a factor of 100 in even the molecular depletion times. So even bottom up by itself can't explain anything, everything, and top down sure can. So um, I'll skip that. So let's quickly uh, go now uh, to the present. And I'm going to give you uh, sort of the rest of the talk. I was, uh, I'm going to run to the top of the hour, warning Thomas, that um, we're going to uh, want to sort of give you, uh, we, to move forward, we clearly have to improve our observations. And uh, one of those is steps needs to be to go back to that 1998 paper, uh, which actually was based on some pretty crummy data and see whether it still holds up. If you haven't got the message by now, uh, my argument would be this paper has been grossly overinterpreted uh, for a long time. And before we overinterpret anymore, let's make sure the results stand up to the data that are now available that are much better. Um, this is work that's uh, being published. Uh, one paper has been published. The other is uh, should be resubmitted and appear in the archive within a couple of weeks. And my co-author is Mia de los Reyes, who was introduced is on the panel today, and will uh, be able to you'll be able to talk to uh, later. So the idea is to redo the analysis with much larger samples, much more diverse samples, and much more accurate measurements of the star formation rates. Uh, these old rates were no better than a factor of two. The new rates are generally good to uh, oh, 20% or so uh, conservatively. And uh, so we can actually look for cosmic scatter in the relations. As an example of how much better you can do 20 years later, these is, uh, this is the 1998 Schmidt law for galaxies like the Milky Way. It's just this part of the diagram. This looks impressive. People you know, write papers about this. This looks like a scatter plot. In fact, the correlation coefficient is less than a half. When you get better data uh, and uh, more data, it gets replaced with this, which really is a very tight Schmidt law. The bottom line is about the same as before, but our confidence in the result is much better than before. Um, so that result, a new result confirms the old. Other new results contradict the 1998 paper. When we break down the correlations to just looking at atomic gas and molecular gas, uh, we reproduce what the Begeel and Leroy and other studies of 10 years ago found, the local studies, where most of the correlation is molecular gas, not with atomic. The 1998 results suggested the opposite, but the data were just weren't good enough. Uh, and so in fact, uh, uh, although I wasn't sure of those results uh, 10 years ago when they first came out, that, that, that we verify them now. They were right all along. Um, I'll not dwell on this slide, but just to say there are entire classes of galaxies, namely dwarf galaxies and low surface brightness galaxies that live in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, threshold regime. And uh, with these quality of data, we can begin to look to see, are there any uh, parameters other than density of gas that influence the Schmidt law? And the answer is yes, Mia found that uh, stellar surface density, among others, can give you a very uh, strong uh, relation. And that confirms a work done previously by a number of other authors. Um, so that is the normal galaxies. Now let us show you the results we've yet to publish. Um, remember what was really got people excited in 1998 was the continuity. Uh, seemed like there was one relation that connected all star forming regimes from these incredibly active mergers to galaxies like the Milky Way. Um, so we've redone that again with about three times more data and much better data. Um, and if I reproduce the plot from 1998 with the new data, what you see is in fact, we confirm uh, the 1998 result. There, the two, you can fit one power law, Schmidt power law, 
follow the data. And in fact, our new slope is 1.52 plus or minus 0.02. So it's actually within one sigma of the theoretically self-gravity predicted 1.5. There's probably some physical significance to that. However, complexity lurks beneath the surface. Uh, I fit these together, but if you look at these orange points, they don't really look like they fit very, as well as these points do, right? Uh, let's do something we couldn't do in 1998. Let's fit the, black, the normal galaxies, the Milky Way type galaxies, and the starburst galaxies separately and see what those fits look like. And voila, suddenly you see they really don't fit together very well at all. Uh, in fact, what happens is that if you fit the, uh, these molecular dominated starbursts different, the slope changes from 1.4 for the spirals to one, nearly 1 1.0 essentially uh, for uh, linear, uh, for consistent with there being all molecular, and they're shifted upwards. The reason this looks pretty good is it's a combination of two changes, a change of slope and a shift in the zero point. Um, if I, this is looking at the combined gas density effect on the star formation. If I just look at the molecular gas um, uh, alone, which remember uh, from the nearby galaxies seems more tightly correlated with the star formation rate. Now this discontinuity, the shift becomes even more apparent. Um, something I don't have time to go into any detail, but somebody could ask about in the q and A is um, this is the best case scenario for bimodality well, uh, to measure convert the measurements of what are molecular hydrogen line fluxes to uh, to uh, molecular hydrogen densities as uh, Monica Rubio knows very well requires a leap of faith in applying a conversion factor. Here, I've made the assumption that most people would disagree with that these starbursts, we use the same conversion as applies to molecular clouds in the Milky Way and applies to these normal galaxies. Even then, you have a shift of a factor of five between here and here. If instead, I adopt a much lower conversion factor uh, than, uh, that is advocated by many spectroscopic measurements of these things, the, the, the shift becomes another factor of three to five bigger. In other words, a factor of 20 or larger. Um, this had been seen previously by Genzel again. This guy does a, he gets into a lot of things, uh, not just Nobel Prize work in the Galactic Center. Um, and we're sort of confirming what has been seen earlier, but was doubted. And the main thing we add is no matter what you do, how you treat this conversion of molecular uh, carbon monoxide to molecular hydrogen, you still get a bimodality uh, no matter what. Um, you can have other fancy uh, density dependent formulae and you change the slope or, and, or the zero point of the Schmidt law when you do it. Um, this last series of slides uh, raises uh, sort of one ugly reality of this field, and that is despite all the effort that has gone into measuring uh, uh, molecular lines in galaxies of different types, uh, work in which Monica is actually a world leader, uh, and shown that this conversion factor varies, um, until we understand better how it applies in these galaxies, we are, our interpretation is entirely determined on the assumptions we make about the molecular hydrogen measurements. So uh, what me and I have done for this paper is tried to get around the problem uh, by instead of using molecular hydrogen as the index of gas density, uh, since these objects are very infrared bright, we can actually fit their infrared spectral energy distributions to measure the masses and surface densities of interstellar dust. We know the dust is metal, well mixed with the gas. Uh, the ratio of dust to gas does not vary much between massive normal spirals and starbursts, if at all. 
at most a factor of two or so. And so we measured dust surface densities for a subset of these galaxies where the infrared data were available and made the same plot. And what you see is we see the same sort of uh, bimodality that we saw earlier. This is the earlier plot for Milky Way uh, XCO. Uh, and so what we conclude is that this bimodality cannot be some artifact of the way we measure molecular gas masses. It is real. There really is, as Genzel, uh, Dotti, uh, Begil, and others had postulated about a decade ago, there is a third regime that the star formation is more efficient here and proceeds uh, in different ways. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Um, so let me, uh, uh, with your permission, run over just five minutes. I don't want to leave you hanging there. Uh, I now just want to point the path, leaving my own work, and ask where is this subject going? Where will your younger generations take this field? Uh, we're left, obviously, the usual situation, work that has raised more questions than answers. But I think the progress made over the last uh, uh, a few years points a very firm direction in how we're going to uh, really crack this problem. Let's do it first from the uh, observational point of view. A key is that uh, we need to understand how molecular clouds work. And the best place to understand that is to look within our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the same uh, aperture synthesis arrays and infrared space observatories that have revolutionized our study in star formation and galaxies have done the same in the Milky Way. Here are two versions of the Taurus molecular cloud, one of the nearest star forming clouds in the Milky Way, uh, on the left in molecular hydrogen, on the right in dust. Uh, like I say, they trace each other. Um, and what you see is that even molecular clouds, which originally were thought to be the ultimate simple spherical cow, uh, gravitationally bound systems, are complex in their own right. They're full of clumps, filaments, fractals, uh, structure. 90% or more of the volume is not forming stars, but there are these dense clumps, these condensations. And when you map those condensations and look where the stars are actually forming today, you can identify those pre-main sequence objects, one star, they exclusively almost form in these clumps as if there's a second threshold within molecular clouds. This finally is probably the ultimate building block we've been looking for, the molecular cloud clump. There is a nice, beautiful linear scaling of star formation, stars, and mass of these clumps. So good news is uh, you, that if you want to understand what sets the star formation efficiency, you just have to study the interstellar medium on this scale. The bad news is bottom up. There's no such thing as bottom. This is bottom right here, the molecular clump. Maybe bottom is in these clumps. But even the molecular clump, what distinguishes these clumps from the rest of the cloud isn't molecules. These are molecules. These are molecules. It's gravity. So the answer is it molecules. Is it gravity? It's both. It's a combination. You need both to be able to uh, make stars. Um, the next frontier here, already underway, is to extend observations, all not quite, but within an order of magnitude of this resolution to other galaxies. This is the FANGS project survey with ALMA, with uh, ESO, the MUSE instrument on the BLT, and Hubble Space Telescope. Here are some of the PIs. And they are taking nearby galaxies and making maps of individual molecular clouds in those systems. They're already beginning to measure scaling laws, look at the uh, distributions of densities and kinematics, and being able to see whether these kind of structures, how they propagate in different interstellar environments and galaxies. There are other surveys that are trying to isolate these molecular cores. Um, but they're impossible to resolve, even with all of them. They're 10 to 100 times too faint and too small. 
But if you identify molecules that only appear in those clumps, you can at least add up the amounts of those dense gas clumps uh, indirectly, and that's underway as well. So lots of work, very exciting projects uh, that uh, you're going to see lots of results coming out. And I know many people in Chile involved in that work. Finally, I've got to answer that question for you, right? What's that about? Uh, we've left one question unanswered, and uh, this is my last three-minute sermon here. What is it? We've talked all about the slope of the Schmidt law. What is it that ought, no matter where you are in the universe, you have a certain amount of gas, you know that only a certain amount of stars can form. Well, part of it is this molecular efficiency, but that molecular efficiency, as you saw from the St. Tones results, varies by a factor of a thousand already. And this is much tighter. So what is causing it? Is it bottom up, top down, or what? And this is where this quotation comes into the uh, story. It requires a story. Uh, Hope you don't mind. Uh, in Cambridge, I worked in Cambridge for 12 years. Those of you who have been there, Elena knows this very well, Mia knows it. Uh, a time-honored tradition is twice a day we get together and we have coffee in the morning and tea in the afternoon. Uh, we usually talk science on Monday morning, I have to admit, the conversation is often on the Premier League football matches of uh, the weekend, but most of the time we talk science and at one of those conversations, I was talking to a guy, many people will know this from, Jerry Ostriker, who came up to me and said, all your work on Schmidt Law, you're wasting your time. Uh, IMF, none of that stuff has anything to do with star formation and galaxies. I have a new set of computer simulations. They show it's the inflow rate of gas from the intergalactic medium onto galaxies. It di dictates everything. And all your IMFs and your molecular cores and your Schmidt laws do is they'll tell you whether you have spiral alarms or not. It's frosting on the cake. Uh, the fundamental uh, climate is set by infall. Um, and I argued with him a little bit. I've learned you don't argue with that guy. Uh, and I gave up. A few days later, another coffee. I spoke to Martin Rees. Many of you know, I hope, Stromer Royal of England, uh, Lord Rees of Ludlow. Uh, you know, amazing individual. And I told him my story about Ostriker. I said he claims all of star formation is dictated at the cosmological scale. And Martin replied with this question. He said, he scratched his head, chin for a few couple of minutes and said, isn't star formation really a bit like the weather? And that's all he said at first. And me, you know, my first reaction was, what? Weather? <laughs> Whether it's start with these, I do. And in fact, my first reaction was that I had been insulted twice in the same week. That he was saying, "Oh, star formation. That's just the frosting on the cake. Whether it rains tomorrow or whether it's going to be a little hotter, you know, climate is the real science." And Ostriker is right. You know, it's really cosmological info. Um, so I was troubled by that. A couple of days later, we met at coffee again. And I said, oh, "You know about this weather stuff." We got to talking about it more, and it turned out he meant something entirely different. He meant that star formation is like the weather in this way. Um, that think of climate as an analogy. Uh, we live uh, in, a, in a very complex ecosystem, right? Uh, with all of these factors, I won't take you through them. Uh, yet astronomers, when we look at star formation or any astronomical we tend to be reductionists. We want to reduce everything to one answer, right? So imagine the following hypothetical Cambridge coffee conversation about climate. You have, Jer you know, you have one astronomer saying, oh, climate, it's so simple. It's all dynamics. It's the interplay of gravity with high pressure and low pressure and ocean currents. And uh, you know, think of how important Coriolis forces are. High, high pressure, low pressure, it's all dynamics. And then a, a molecular line astronomer comes up to you and says, no, 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 climate's so simple. It's a single molecule. It's molecular water, right? Water, uh, think of rain, ice caps, oceans, 
uh, water vapor, clouds, hurricanes. Obviously, it's the that's what really drives climate. You can explain everything with liquid, you know, molecular water. And then somebody else says, oh no, it's molecular, it's chemical abundances, right? Look at what a few parts per million increase in carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere over the last couple hundred years has done to our climate. Um, and, you know, and I hope, I, of course, with Zoom, I can't tell if you are chuckling at me or with me, uh, but I hope you see the absurdity of the argument, right? The hypothetical. Is, is molecular water important? Are dynamics important? Or is chemical atmospheric composition important? Yes, yes, and yes. In fact, the fallacy is to believe you can explain everything without the other. In fact, the key to understanding this system is to understand, it's the connections, not the individual process. The connections are as important as the processes and explaining it, this has been recognized in climate science for about 20 years now. And there are all of these institutes around the world. NASA even has in her system science uh, division uh, where you, know, you can apply for grants in this. And in astronomy, we've come around to realize that that's the answer. Yes, star formation is like the weather in that if you want to understand the problem, you have to understand this whole interconnected system. Now, don't get the idea this idea is original with me. No, no way. Um, it actually goes by lots of names today, self-regulated star formation, the galactic ESO system, back, black uh, bathtub model. Uh, Oort cycle is the first because Jan Oort, among other things, in the 1950s wrote the first paper I found on this. Um, but it treats the whole uh, si uh, system uh, together. This is now being done. People aren't just waving their hands and drawing pretty pictures. Uh, this is an example of simulation, University of Chicago, uh, in which you build feedback and star formation into a disk in a self consistent way and watch the migration. Be careful, this is not a Schmidt law, it's a, a pressure. Uh, uh, state diagram. Uh, Eve Ostreicher's group at Princeton is a leader in this. Uh, they model in 3D a galactic disk, well, 2D galactic systems. And what they find is what regulates the star formation is actually an equilibrium, a balance between you raise the star formation rate, you increase the feedback, you disrupt the molecular gas, that lowers the star formation and you create limit cycles. And when you look at any one galaxy, the star formation is constantly going up and down. If you average over a whole bunch of them and plot them in terms of a Schmidt law, you get a nice power law with not much scatter. So I suspect that the answers go there. So I have mercilessly beat the time uh, uh, limit placed on me. I am going to shut up, apologize, shut up, uh, and at least uh, leave up my takeaway points. Basically, yes, these recipes still work really well, but if you want to understand the physics, you have to understand the couplings at every scale matters. Uh, if you're working on galaxies, you better understand how individual stars form and vice versa, because the exciting physics is in the connections and the interfaces between those regimes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob. This was a fantastic and extremely lucid overview of this, of this weather phenomenon that we have in our universe. I really like this analogy of, of the weather. It actually shows that, like we study the weather now, apparently on different planets, right, on exoplanets can have also their weather. There are different equilibria. And so in your work, you have shown that there are distinct equilibria, apparently, of this weather phenomenon that we call star formation, which is really interesting. It's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting problem for your undergraduate students. If you take the dynamic range of scales, the ratio of the diameter of the Earth to the, the size of a, a raindrop uh, is about equal to the ratio of the virial radius of a galaxy to say the size of a supernova progenitor or something like that, you know, it even works. Should I stop sharing screen or? Uh...
Uh, yes, please. Yeah, so we can see each other. Um, so I would like to open the Q&A. Um, are there any questions from the panel? Let's go to the panel first. Um, Paul has a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> thanks for the very nice talk. And uh, um, you showed that in the new sample you, you chose to reevaluate the Kennecott Schmidt law. You also included dwarf galaxies. And uh, did you also aim at parameterizing the Kennecott Schmidt law for dwarf galaxies only? I mean, from the plot, I saw that they're all in the threshold region, right? But uh, we know that dwarf galaxies have a very distinct morphology compared to bright galaxies. So maybe, and also we see that they have different. Uh, uh, stellar surface density, right? So maybe, are there any correlations uh, with these parameters? Or? Yeah, um, this is much of Mia's work. I'll begin answering so she can begin formulating. I'm going to turn over to her in a second. Uh, the, uh, uh, we actually had a set of dwarf starburst galaxies as well, so-called blue compact dwarfs, many of you are aware of. And we had hoped to apply this analysis to those as well. Um, but the trouble is they're very metal, the dwarfs are very metal poor and it's very difficult to get reliable CO detections, uh, much less uh, measurements uh, of uh, the gas mass. And you can't use the dust either because their dust to gas ratios are very small. So we tried, but uh, you know, we got some results that just, uh, in fact, the referee put a mercy kill to <laughs> Uh, are publishing that because there just wasn't much interesting. But Mia, do you want to uh, elaborate on any of that, uh, particularly for the normal dwarfs? Sure, yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, so for the typical dwarf galaxies, as Rob mentioned, a lot of them, we can't detect them in molecular gas because they're CO dark. Um, but we were able to get upper or lower limits on their total gas mass by looking at the atomic gas. And so we see that even with these lower limits, these dwarf galaxies are already falling significantly under what we would expect for the typical spiral and starburst galaxies in the kennecott kind of schmidt relation. So we think this is telling us it could be related to this phase transition between uh, molecular and atomic gas that we've seen in, in spatially resolved studies that Adam Leroy and Frank Beagle and others have been looking at. Uh, it could be something else. It could just be that the dwarf galaxies, we, we need more information really about the dwarf galaxies to tell. But yeah, I think Rob, basically hit it on the head, which is that the dwarf galaxies are incredibly uncertain, much more than the other systems. And we weren't even able to take into account morphology or anything just because it was already difficult just to detect them. And the dwarf galaxies, if I might uh, add to this, um, the sample was selected from groups of galaxies, uh, local volume. Yeah, most of them, uh, we had uh, 10 years earlier done a volume limited sample of uh, galaxies within 10 mega, 11 megaparsecs of the Milky Way. Uh, that obviously is com incomplete for the very faintest systems, but that uh, it was mainly, that formed the parent sample for, for most of the observations. Uh, most did not have CO, um, but they, uh, most of them have uh, 21 centimeter uh, measurements. They had to be mapped in 21 centimeters. And they they lie to the right of the Schmidt law in the uh, in the in, uh, in the Schmidt uh, uh, in the threshold regime, even when you don't even count the molecular gas, the atomic gas alone puts them to the right of the Schmidt law. So that's why we could draw that conclusion. Adding molecular gas would only make them even more in the threshold regime if there is molecular gas in them. Yeah, definitely parameter space to explore further. Yeah, let's go to Francisca next. Hi, thanks for your great talk. So this is a question from the from the people in the audience. This is from Chantal Yang. Sorry if I don't pronounce it well, but it says, in addition to the tracers like CO that you are currently using, what would be the most promising ways of accurately calibrate the total mass of molecular gas? Yeah, uh, with Monica on the panel, it seems like one for you. Uh, would you be comfortable uh, taking it? I hope I don't uh, disappoint the uh, the uh, person asked the question if I turn to the world's expert. <laughs> uh, OK, 
Okay, then that's a difficult answer, no? Uh, observational, we're being, using CO as much as we can. And uh, I believe that maybe if we can get a, a sample of CO observations of uh, dwarf galaxies, a larger sample of dwarf galaxy, we may kind of understand a little bit better how does uh, the CO to H2 relation holds in, in galaxies which are less massive. And, um, but we are faced with the problem also of metallicity. And um, what uh, we thought it would be a good uh, other tracer, which is dust, as you show, she seems to be an alternative. But unfortunately, on the low metallicity galaxies, the continuum emission from dust seems to behave anomalously, and we have an excess of emission on, on the submillimeter wavelengths that we don't understand yet. So it's very complicated. And uh, as you say, it's like the weather. We measure one thing and we can explain in one environment and we measure with another tracer and we can explain the other environment. Um, what it seems to be interesting from the latest studies that uh, we have been doing on the um, Small Magellanic Cloud and the Magellanic Bridge that now we have parsec size resolution CO maps is that uh, when you go and map um, uh, molecular clouds at this scale, the conversion factors uh, tends to be to trends to be the same factor as you get in the galaxy, like the normal XCO. That is what we are finding, only a factor of two to three difference um, in contrast of, of what we used to find when we were uh, observing with 50 parsec resolution, this molecular class, which this factor was a factor of 10 or even 20. So this is also saying something about um, um, the properties of the molecular clouds. And as you mentioned, one of the things that we need to, to know better is what are the properties of the molecular clouds at these uh, different scales in other galaxies. And now with the new instrumentation, I think we have a great opportunity to, to do that. So unfortunately, there's no answer which is the best tracer right now, but we have to live with that. Yeah, I can elaborate just a bit. The, we have the similar problem as you saw from the results in the starbursts, in these very luminous starbursts. There you have plenty of dust. And I think dust measurements provide you a far more uh, reliable approach. And in fact, most of what we know about variations in the conversion factor have come from comparison of dust, uh, not in the dwarfs, but in more massive galaxies. The other is to observe many uh, multiple transitions of the same molecules like CO and multiple uh, molecules to fit them in a reaction network. And the hope is uh, with all that redundant information, you may be able to constrain temperatures and densities and so on better. But uh, the results you saw in this paper about uh, the starburst being more consistent with Milky Way conversion has been seen in, by experts in the so recently, particularly the Max Planck group of Genzel and Tacconi uh, using other techniques. So uh, it's, 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 it's attracting a lot of attention to the subject, I'm sure. Uh, we'll know a lot more in the coming years. Great, let's go to Ivano next. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob, for your uh, great, great talk. Uh, I have a, also a question from the um, Q&A window, and it's from my, Brian Miller, and he asked, uh, how are you now measuring the current star formation rates, and what are the most reliable methods? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, we, you, we have a whole suite of methods. Uh, uh, you adapt the ideal method to the type of uh, galaxy you're observing. Um, the biggest problem traditionally was correcting 
fringe or stellar dust. Uh, in dusty galaxies, the ultraviolet and visible underestimate the star formation. In galaxies like dwarfs that don't have much dust, the infrared underestimates the star formation. So almost all modern methods uh, either use a combination of two wavelengths, usually, for example, what Mia did for our spiral galaxies was ultraviolet in combination with an infrared wavelength. Uh, uh, in the case of the dusty starbursts, they are so dusty, infrared by itself gives an answer that's good to three or four uh, percent because nothing else gets out. Um, what other, the, the state of the art is actually if you have observed a galaxy at a large number of wavelengths from the ultraviolet to the submillimeter, you can actually fit the entire spectrum uh, to a, 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 a dust heating model, an absorption model, and that gives you the most accurate star formation rate of all. Of all. Uh, Medrique Bouquin up at Montefagasto, for example, uh, uses the Segal code and does that sort of thing. Let's go to Felipe next. Thanks, thanks Bob, for you know a very nice talk. Um, I have a, one question and actually a couple, one comment. Um, we we use these scaling laws, you know, even up to high redshift, and all the models, you know, they they you know reproduce all the observations we have for galaxies in the nearby universe as well. So, could you comment on what are the major ca caveats? we should have, you know, extending this to a very high redshift that we are observing right now. Okay. And second- Thank you for we, asking that question. I do have opinions. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's it. And the thing that scares me second. most is people try to estimate gas masses of high redshift galaxies with no data. They measure the star formation rate and they turn my relation backwards. <laughs> and that's very dangerous, of course. Uh, I think uh, the if you're it, I think if you're looking at statistical ensembles of galaxies and you are looking at large samples and you're uh, looking at galaxy you know the infrared luminous starbursts uh, that we talked about in this talk are ex very rare objects they're very very compact regions. They're forming nuclei and bulges of galaxies. They're present at high redshift in some millimeter galaxies, but are quite rare. Uh, I think the high redshift, most high redshift galaxies are just scaled up ver uh, where the star formation is extended over many, many kiloparsecs. And I think uh, as far as we can tell, the local relation is preserved. Uh, this was shown for the first time by Francois Boucher and uh, Genzel's group back in 2008, even though, which is interesting, even though the star formation rates are getting bigger and bigger, it's because the gas densities are getting bigger and bigger and they're climbing the same relation. I think the main thing you have to worry about is if you get a population of high redshift galaxies that are the analogs of ARP220 and these very extreme compact systems, then you might flip to a different mode. You still see that, 1.5 uh, interpolation still works pretty well. Uh, so I think statistically it's, uh, it's the best we have and it's reliable, but if you really want precision, uh, I'd, I'd want to find, you know, you'd want independent confirmation. And if for some reason using the law gave you a physically, then you applied it to a model and you get, and you get a physically inconsistent answer. Uh, you should, you know, include in your list of possible troubleshooting that, that, that maybe there are, uh, that that law is broken down in some way. I don't know. Thanks. That's all I can think of. I don't know, Mia, if you have anything to add to that. Or... And Good question. So the, second, the second question was, you know, if you could get, you know, a significant amount of time on any facility today, what do you would use for this kind of work? That's easy. Uh, <laughs> already being done. I I would do the Fangs project. Okay. Uh, you know, Ava Schindler and Adam Leroy and Eric Russellowski 
In fact, they're using the parent sample as our King's, my, you know, the, the project, Kingfish and Sings project, which I led to start all these new observations. They're using the same samples, but using, uh, using the incredible resolution of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, yes. of, of, you know, VLT and ALMA to really do this cloud by cloud. I think, I, I feel, I don't work a whole lot in this field, you know, I'm semi-retired, uh, but I sleep well at night knowing there are brilliant people who are doing the same things that I would do if I had access. All I would ask is, uh, and you know, if you extend the question someday, you know, a 10 meter infrared telescope in space, <laughs> cold, uh, so you could get infrared maps, you know, at arc second resolution too, that would even be better, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Mario had a question. Thank you very much for a very nice review. Um, I have a question from Rodrigo Freitas asking about the role of um, environment on the Kennicott Schmidt law. Can you comment? Uh, yeah, it's a great uh, question. Um, in, uh, we have not looked at environment uh, in context of the law ourselves uh, directly. In our first paper on the normal galaxies, there's a whole part of Mia's paper that I didn't have time to talk about that looked for effects of second parameters. Um, uh, what has been done is uh, you saw the plots I showed you on molecular depletion times by uh, uh, Amelie Santonge. That group that includes uh, uh, Huang and Kaufman uh, in Germany uh, have done some, uh, that, that's part of a larger project, Cold Gas, which has tried to look at environmental influences on the total molecular and atomic uh, gas contents and one possible connecting it to the star formation rate. Uh, what you find is, as many of you probably already know, uh, environment, especially in rich clusters, uh, uh, tends to uh, enhance quenching uh, gas depletion. Of, and in many cases, quenching of star formation, but not necessarily with a different star formation law. Just drive, it'll eventually drive the star formation over the threshold. In the Huang and Kaufman papers, which I actually read just this week, <laughs> conveniently, um, they do see some uh, systematic changes in depletion time, in, in effectively in the molecular Schmidt law, with things like spiral arm structure and bars internal structures. They haven't been able to look as a function of environment, but based on those results, I would not be surprised if uh, there might be a, these are very small second order effects. Uh, they'd be worth looking for, it'd be a good project for somebody. I don't think there'll be anything dramatic, but it should be checked. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Elena. Hi, Rob. Thank you very Hi. much for a lovely talk. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions, really, but they are related. So if you don't mind, I'll continue yes, together. Um, when you compare, <clears throat> I mean, one of the questions is, how easy is it to define quantities? Can you hear me? Uh, if you could speak a little louder, yeah, I, it, I got a little distortion there. Hey, um, how easy is it to define star formation rate or, or um, um, star formation rate per unit surface um, in irregular kind of star bursting galaxies? And the second question is um, when you compare the SK law for starbursts and spiral disks. Um, again, in starbursts, the star forming processes occur in bursts and in different places, so it's not as um, uniform as it would be in the regular. So, how do you deal with that? 
Yeah, thank you, Elena, for both of those. Let me take the second question first. Uh, yeah, because it get, allows me to make a couple important clarifications. When we measure the star formation rate per unit area in a starburst, the area that is used is the area containing the star formation, the compact center. That's what gives you the high surface densities. And in fact, in, our, in that study, some of the starburst nuclei are actually barred galaxies that have a certain nuclear starburst, and the entire galaxy is in the comparison sample. Uh, we're actually measuring both. Um, something that I wanted to say that you didn't quite ask, but I think I should have said, I emphasized more in the talk, we really aren't sure whether that, that the, what we see in our data is bimodality. We see that the, that the star, infrared luminous starbursts are in one part of the diagram with a different slope and a different slope in the normal and the lower left. We don't know, there might be a continuum in between. Remember, we select the starburst. The starburst galaxy by its own definition is one that has a short depletion time, has a very high star formation rate relative to its gas. They have to be different. It's just, they could have just been higher up the same power law. And so what we need is, a, we have a paper three, we are planning to try to see if there is a whole population of galaxies in between uh, that would, and that would be relevant to your question. It would allow us to answer your second question. So keep that, it was in the slides, but it was toward the end and I had to skip it. Uh, your first question was how to, how well we can measure star formation rates in irregular galaxies, was it? Well, how do you define it when you have a, a yeah, Define it, it, it's another excellent question. Uh, especially in the dwarf galaxies um, or in a small area, when we measure a star formation across the whole Milky Way, uh, if you take the Milky Way for an example, across the Milky Way, there are thousands of uh, stars in the process of forming in one place or another. And when you measure the star formation rate of the whole Milky Way, you're averaging over all masses of stars in all stages. Some of these regions are in an early stage, some in a later, and you rely on the central limit theorem, essentially, that if you have a large galaxy, you're observing a random distribution of ages and so on, so that that star formation rate is like a thermodynamic average of what's going on in the galaxy. When you look on either very small scales, or as, or as Elena asks, in very small galaxies, then those approximations break down that you can have small regions that are dominated by a single star, the light. And the rest, even the recipes we use convert light to star formation rate will break down. And there are lots of papers by Krupa and others on this subject. So one of the reasons you saw the dwarf galaxies in Mia's study have that huge scatter is the error bars of the individual star formation rates are very large just from these physical effects. So all you can really do is characterize the statistical average. Uh, and uh, 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 the other way to do it, of course, for a small galaxy is you don't use uh, uh, tracers of star formation that are sensitive to O stars like H alpha or ultraviolet. You go measure individual young stellar objects uh, like we do in the Milky Way, count individual stars, do a CMD, and then you can get around some of these problems. But, but yeah, good, two good questions. Thank you. I see Hans has a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I had, I had, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm also retired, as you know, <laughs> and the retired people, they sometimes they get difficult questions, questions of the wise men. And so I ask you a political oh, you, question. You always ask difficult questions. Go right ahead. Yeah. Oh, I have simple ones too. But the political question is, is since you are on the decadal review, um, 
maybe you don't have to answer it, but I wonder whether star formation research capabilities like satellites, W first or what have you, uh, will still be recommended and will play a role in the in in the next decade. Uh, so you probably heard that speaker was 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 uh, dismissed by ESA, and so the speaker could have measured very low dust surface densities, and so that's out of the window. So I'm wondering which direction you were thinking for the future of uh, star formation research, like a super Herschel or something like that. Yeah, well, of course, I, I cannot comment on specific projects. Uh, like everything else, our survey has been delayed by COVID. Uh, we're still yeah. deliberating. We hope to have our results announced in the spring instead of in January, as was originally mm -hmm. planned. And of course, cannot leak anything. But what I can say is we had six science panels for Astro 2020. One of them is uh, star formation and interstellar medium chaired by uh, uh, Lee Hartman. And uh, they wrote okay. a report. So I think you can be confident that the report will say a lot about the subject. But I can't talk about okay. recommended projects. Fine. Uh, this, this was good enough. Thank you very much. I mean, since this was a short answer, I have another scientific question. And that is, where does the galactic center fall on the Kennecott-Schmidt relation, like as a function of scale, say from one kiloparsec, 100 parsec, 10 parsec, one parsec? Yeah, this is the so-called CMZ or something, Central Molecular yes. Zone, right? And yes. uh, people like Steve Longmore, and uh, Diedrich uh, Kreuzen, yourself, you know, many, many people have uh, studied Don't this region. Uh, it is quite anomalous. Uh, uh, <coughs> it, it's unusual in the sense there, is, there are very dense uh, concentrations of gas, but because of uh, the, its location in a very dense region, you know, not just the black hole, but these very large nuclear star clusters, the uh, tidal fields are very high. Uh, uh, the you know yes. the disruption, the potential for disrupting clouds is much larger than the solar neighborhood, and the influences of all these have been traced. Obviously, there's there are many young stars, right? We use some of them <laughs> to measure the black hole and win Nobel prizes and all that. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm not an expert on that. I collaborated on one paper, you know. 10 years ago, but it, it's, uh, it, it, is, it, it does provide a unique laboratory because of the combination of, of, uh, of tidal field and uh, concentration of gas and radiation field and so on, that I think you know, is gonna be very valuable in understanding some of these more distant circumnuclear starbursts and so on. But I don't, there might be other people on the panel who could speak to it with more expertise than I can. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Evelyn had a question, I think. My question was from the Q&A and it was covered by someone else. Okay, then um, I'm going to pick another question from the Q&A that is slightly related also to, to my field of star cluster and starburst. Rodrigo Fantas is asking, is there any maximum star formation rate possible in a given galaxy. And I would like to extend that to, you know, where actually you maximize star formation in the history of the universe. Oh, great question. You have a good audience there. Uh, so, uh, and since it's related to your, you may, Thomas, you may want to elaborate on anything I can say. Uh, yeah, there are limits um, for normal galaxies. Uh, uh, think back to that very first diagram I showed you with the 10 to the 8th ranges. Uh, the limit uh, is about 10 to 20 solar masses a year, and it happens to be roughly the ratio of the mass of gas left in the most massive galaxies today divided by the Hubble time for a couple billion years. And it's just saying essentially the rate of uh, the, what sets the limit is the gas supply. Um, 
in the case of the uh, in, in the case of the ultra luminous uh, starbursts, these things that, for example, what sets that roughly 1,000 solar uh, mass limit? There are two limits uh, that are discussed a lot in the literature. One is you can imagine in a merger of galaxies, you take all of the gas, most of the gas in those galaxies, they collapse <coughs> into the central, oh, 1,000 parsecs or so and form this very dense disk. Uh, there's a maximum rate that you can turn that gas into stars, uh, even if the efficiency is 100% of star formation. It's simply the ratio of the mass of that gas divided by the time it took to, for all that gas to collect. And that's basically the crossing time of the merger of the galaxy. And so the most massive uh, gas disks uh, are up to about uh, 10, about uh, 10 to the 10, 10 billion solar masses. Uh, dynamical time is usually on the order of uh, 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight solar masses in that you get out of that this so uh, a few hundred or a couple thousand solar masses, which agrees well with the limit. Finally, there has uh, been postulated by, I believe, uh, let me think, Murray, uh, Peterson, and Elliot Cotard, uh, that there can be a limit in these extreme starbursts uh, that the radiation pressure from the, all of the light from the uh, stars, of course, that light's all being absorbed by dust, right? Dust absorbing typically 96% more of the light. Well, there's a radiation pressure <laughs> on that dust. And eventually, uh, some of it will evaporate the dust, but eventually you will actually, the radiation pressure can actually trigger an outflow of dust, which will entrain gas and create a giant molecular outflow. These are observed. And so uh, those two, for the bursts, you get this limit of a couple of thousand solar masses today from those two mechanisms. As a function of redshift, the limits are probably higher because when the universe was a quarter of its current age, there were galaxies that were entirely made out of gas, 10 to the 11 solar masses, almost all gas. And the dynamical times weren't much different. So if they had 10 times more gas at cosmic noon, the maximum could probably go up to 10,000 solar masses back then. So this is all back in the envelope, of course, but I don't know that's a satisfactory answer. Very nice. Um, maybe one last question also from Rodrigo Freitas. <laughs> this is <clears throat> sort of a corollary of Hans' question, maybe not leaning toward to, too far out of the window with your answer. What kind of physical process that strongly affects star formation that we don't understand well today um, we could be studied with numerical simulations and backed by the upcoming future generations of observatories. We could, this would be a great go around the panel. Uh, I'll put my hand up and say magnetic fields. <laughs> Everyone runs away. But an IMF uh, would be an initial, I, I'm, I saw Hans's light go on and I can't see the word Zimmiker and not say initial mass function, but why doesn't everybody the panel chime in? You're, you're so kind. Anyone else? Yeah. We don't even try magnetic fields, you know. And, uh, the people who work on it on the galactic scale do, and we know it's important. And the magnetic, hold up a whole I think the magnetic field will be, will be play a role, if, even in the galactic center, because there's something like the ma magnetically critical change mass that uh, Telemachos, Muscovias, and Frank Shu have been talking about in the past. And when the magnetic fields get compressed, like it's possible in the galactic center, then this, this may be relevant. Yeah. And so magnetic field measurements are, are important, but um, probably they're coming and maybe our, our observatory Sophia can help a little bit here. With the yeah. hog maybe, maybe for the general audience, I should elaborate on what I meant by initial mass function. 
but it's the distribution of the stars. How many stars of different masses do you make? But this, every time we try to prove it, it's different in different parts of the universe, these, these claims usually almost always go away. But frankly, the, the best explanation for, if this bimodality you are seeing in the service is real, the most likely explanation is these, uh, these very, very dense uh, regions uh, put much more of their stars into the more massive and bright stars. Uh, so that actually, uh, when we measure the light, we're, we're actually overestimating the number of the mass of stars form because that function changes. If, if, not, if fewer low mass, low mass stars have most of the mass in the stellar population, but they don't emit much of the light in a starburst. And if they're depleted, it means that when I use the standard recipes for measuring star formation rates, which assume uh, a mass distribution like in the Milky Way, that means we're grossly overestimating the star formation rate. It could be as simple as that, but trying to prove it <laughs> is uh, uh, several of us have devoted our careers to that and not succeeded yet. Good project for the future. Thank you. Okay. okay, let's wrap it up there. So thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you very much for Rob uh, to Rob for taking the time to tell us about your work. Um, so just a reminder to our audience, please be so kind as to fill out the survey at the end of the Zoom webinar. And our next scheduled talk will be October 23rd, that's next Friday, and will be given by Suzanne Staggs, a professor at Princeton University and the principal investigator of the advanced ACTPOI experiment. Uh, so as for now, stay safe, stay, stay healthy, and we'll see you all at the ne next golden webinar. Ciao.